Hello. In this lecture, we will be talking about physiological buffers, meaning buffers that operate within the body. So over here, we have the common buffer systems. Now, buffers, they always want, they always want equilibrium. So they will do everything in their power to keep everything in balance, meaning that if your blood is too acidic, it will try to buffer it into a basic environment. If your blood is too basic, it will try to buffer it into an acidic environment, okay? So it wants to keep everything equal or at a steady state, okay? So over here we have some, uh, we have two um, kind of like sides to buffers. So some of the buffers uh, refer to intracellular fluid, okay? Meaning that they are within the cells uh, for instance, the phosphate buffer system is within the cells, and some of them are extracellular, meaning that they are outside of the cells, okay? So like the carbonic bicarbonate buffer system, that's mainly in blood, and blood is outside of the cells, right? So it's going to interact with the environment. It's not going to just interact with itself, All right? So uh, let's get right into it, and here we go. So the main thing that sticks out is that the, pro the protein buffer systems actually interact with the intracellular fluid, ICF, and the extracellular um, fluid, ECF. So this, the protein, so we're going to call it protein buffer system, okay, is essentially interacts with the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, so that's going to be ECF, okay? And it is usually the only buffer system that extensively interacts with other buffer systems. So it interacts with other bu buffer systems Now, focus on the ECF systems. The most important extracellular fluid uh, buffer system would have to be their carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. Now, that's a mouthful, but essentially, this guy right here actually helps regulate the pH in the blood. So this one actually regulates the pH in the blood. Now, unless you're some sort of water bear or some sort of like alien octopus or something, you're going to have blood. Most organisms have blood. So they're going to utilize the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system in order to regulate the pH in their blood. Okay, And we're actually going to go into it um, uh, of how that works in detail in a, in a little bit. But I have another buffer system that needs to be described. And before we move on, of course, this is the most important. So the most important uh, ECF buffer. Now, the phosphate buffer system is kind of important. Well, it's pretty important for the ICF. So the phosphate buffer system And let's just call that BS or you know buffer system, whatever. And it helps regulate the pH of the ICF and urine. Okay, so if you ever go to the doctor and your doctor says, hey, your pH in your urine is really acidic, you know, you might have something wrong with the phosphate buffers in your system and that could lead to some serious consequences. Uh, perhaps perhaps a cirrhosis of the liver or another um, attack on the kidneys, right? So the phosphate buffer system is a system that helps regulate the pH of the majority of the ICF and the urine, okay? So now we'll go and talk about the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. 
So right here is going to be the bicarbonate um, equation. Uh, more specifically, the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, if you want to be specific, right? But here's like the full um, equation, the list of steps that happen first, okay? So what happens here is that whenever you, you know, uh, exhale or, um, you know, exhale from your lungs, you're expelling carbon dioxide. But during that reaction, there's also aqueous carbon dioxide, and that is in your blood. Okay, so that aqueous carbon dioxide is going to react with liquid water, and what happens is that it's going to make what? Well, it's going to make carbonic acid. Okay, that's carbonic acid. So the aqueous carbon dioxide in your blood reacts with the water or in the environment to create carbonic acid, okay, which is acidic, obviously has acid in its name. <laughs> Um, so then that carbonic acid kind of reacts with itself to make bicarbonate, okay? So this is bicarbonate, and which is uh, basic, okay? So this is acidic, this is going to be basic, and of course you have uh, your proton, right? So some acid as well. However, if you were kind of like slick, if you were very intuitive, you would know that some of this is very repetitious, right? So there's some repeating factors in this equation. For instance, we have carbon dioxide aqueous on this side. And on the left hand side, we also have carbon dioxide aqueous. So these can actually cancel out, okay? That could cancel out, okay? Now, what else do we have? We have uh, carbonic acid aqueous on this side, and we also have carbonic acid aqueous on that side. So we could cancel those out. So are there any more matching pairs? No. So we can actually write a net reaction because if your step, if your um, products show up as reactants, you could just cancel them out. So in, in um, the net reaction would have to be CO2 as a gas, which enters in your lungs. And it's going to react with the water in your body and it's going to go like this to create bicarbonate. Which is the aqueous uh, product. And then plus some acid, which is also uh, aqueous. So what we just described was the carbonic anhydrase. Okay, and that actually helps disassociate um, the reactants into the products. More specifically, it helps um, essentially disassociate carbonic acid into bicarbonate. So, this, uh, let's see, so C8 carbonic acid. into bicarbonate and H plus. So again, bicarbonate is HCO3 negative. If you don't see the carbonic acid, all you have to do is just combine these guys to make H2CO3, okay? So that's all that is. So let's write that over here, H2CO3. So that's just a combination of carbon dioxide with water, all right? You can write it like that or in this form, okay? Either way is fine, but that is your reaction, the carbonic anhydrase reaction, all right? Now the pKa for this uh, reaction, so the pKa, for this reaction is going to be about 6.4, which is pretty close to the pH of blood, 7.4. So it's fairly good, I guess, right here. Uh, but then we're going to introduce another concept called Le Chatelier's Principle. So if you remember Le Chatelier's Principle from Chemistry 2, you would know that if you were to take away a reactant, 
you would actually increase one of your products. If you were to take away one of your products, you would increase the presence of one of your reactants. So for instance, if I were to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide, I would actually increase the amount of acid or hydrogens, okay? So in that case, we can say that decreasing, so lower CO2 makes um, more H plus and pH goes down. So it becomes acidic. So it's acidic. Okay? And basic would have to be this. Okay? So if we decrease the amount of bicarbonate in the blood, we'd actually increase the carbon dioxide. If the CO2 increases, then the pH will actually go up, meaning that it will become a basic environment. So um, if you lower lower HCO3, and it makes more CO2, and the pH goes up. Okay, so that makes a basic environment. Okay. So if you were to add a base to the reaction, this is what would happen. So if we add base, in this case, let's say it's uh, hydroxide, well, it's going to react with the, what, carbonic acid, okay? So the base is gonna react with the acid, and it's gonna form the conjugate base, okay? So this is going to be the acid right here. So it's going to be the carbonic acid, let's just call it C acid and that's the base. This is going to form the conjugate uh, conjugate base. And this is going to be what? The conjugate acid. Okay, there you go. So of course, if you want to find the ratio, it would be HCO3 negative over H2CO3, right? So of course, you would see how that can be a really good buffer for our systems. So in the same way, if you were to add acid, okay, in this case it's a form of a proton, the proton would react with what? Bicarbonate. Because in the system there's always going to be a little bit of bicarbonate hanging around, there's always going to be a little bit of carbonic acid hanging around um, in case you were to add acid or bases, okay? So in this case if we were to add acid one of the uh, bicarbonates that are just hanging around would react with it to form the, what? Carbonic acid. So you can see how, depending on what happens, the system is always gonna buffer. Now the upper limit for the buffer, meaning that the maximum that it can go to without um, exhausting itself is uh, 7.4, which is roughly the pH for blood. So I think that's a pretty important uh, pH to know. So 7.4 is the pH of your blood. So it's slightly basic, very slightly. So let's recap the carbonic bicarbonate buffer system, okay? So whenever you're exercising or sleeping or petting a cat or something, you're breathing in air, okay? So the air is going to do what? It's going to come into the lungs and hit the blood. Now the blood either takes it to your muscles, in the, in the example of exercising, and it converts the oxygen with fuel. So fuel plus oxygen gives you energy. Now when that oxygen is depleted, it becomes carbon dioxide and some water. All right? Now the carbon dioxide and the water come out. All right? They come out. Now some of the carbon dioxide kind of dissolves in the blood with the water. Now, whenever the carbon dioxide and the water combine, they actually make the what? They make carbonic acid. Now, the formation of the carbonic acid is actually sped up by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, okay? So the formation, make uh, H2CO3 is um, sped up by enzyme. carbonic acid.
or car sorry, carbonic anhydrase. Okay, there you go. Now that carbonic acid is then absorbed in the blood because initially the concentration of carbonic acid in the blood is very low. So whenever you add a lot of it, it's going to be absorbed. Okay. So it does its things, you know, it helps regulate the pH of the blood, whatever. But sometimes there's an excess amount of acid in the blood. So for instance, there's too many protons hanging out. So what happens is that the blood, well, the plasma, takes some of the hydrogens away from the cells, away from the membranes. And that hydrogen is going to then react with the bicarbonate, okay? Now, whenever it reacts with the bicarbonate, it forms, again, the, what, carbonic acid. But then that carbonic acid goes through another reaction to form carbon dioxide and water. So you can consider the formation of the acid and the, bicar the bicarbonate sorry, to form CO2 and H2O, okay? And so that's what happens when you ex, uh, exhale. So if you go up to a mirror and you exhale, you're going to see the mirror fog up. Well, that's some of the water. That's some of the carbon dioxide. Okay. And here's a quick fact. Did you know that if you were to um, lose weight, let's say 20 kilograms, more than half of those kilograms are going to be exhaled through carbon dioxide. Okay. So when you lose fat from exercising, you don't sweat it out. You actually breathe it out. Okay and some of it passes through your urine. So for a quick recap, whenever you breathe oxygen, it goes through your lungs, into the blood, and goes into the active tissues and organs, for instance, the heart or the muscles. Then it is combined with fuel, for instance, uh, glucose, which is simple uh, sugar. It is then converted into carbon dioxide and water. That carbon dioxide then dissolves in the water to form uh, carbonic acid. Whenever there's too much acid in the blood, the plasma is going to take away some of the acid, the protons, from the membranes and combine it with bicarbonate. Now that is going to give you carbon dioxide and water which release from the body from an exhale. So hopefully that actually clears up the whole process of breathing and the regulation of pH in your blood and organs. And before I forget, the um, regulation for bicarbonate actually comes from the kidneys okay so the kidneys actually produce and regulate the bicarbonate in your system so now we will be going into depth with the function of the kidneys in the carbonic bicarbonate buffer system okay so if the kidneys wanted to do a short-term adjustment to the equation for instance you know Maybe there's too many uh, acids in the blood. Maybe there's too much bases, too many bases in the blood. Well, the short-term adjustment, so let's say short-term adjustment, would have to be what? Change your breathing pattern, okay? So change breathing pattern. How many... Uh, carbon dioxide molecules get in at one time how much do you let out do you let out more than you put in you know that actually changes the um, the pH of the blood change breathing uh, patterns okay but what if there's a long-term adjustment so long term would have to be the um, well it would have to go into the kidneys so long term is kidney based because it has the option to actually remove excess acids or remove excess bases via the urine. So we can put can remove, remove excess, let's say acids or bases. In this case, uh, it would be uh, bicarbonate. So HCO3 negative uh, via the urine. So there we go. So if you were producing urine that was too acidic, well, that's actually your kidneys saying, hey, you know, you have too much acid in your blood. 
your pH is too low, we're gonna have to remove some of that acid to kind of make it a basic environment, get it back to 7.4, okay? So that's pretty important for you to know. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it's actually the acid that is the problem. Sometimes your uh, urine is too acidic, so it's gonna be the acid that goes. If, you're, if your urine is too basic, well, it's gonna remove some of that bicarbonate, but most often than not, some of the bicarbonate is gonna be reclaimed. So most HCO3 is gonna be reclaimed before it passes through the urine. So let's actually talk about the uh, diagram that I have right here, okay? So in the kidney cell, some of the acid is going to go out of the cell in exchange for some sodium, okay? So whenever you eat salt or um, take a supplement or something, the sodium ions are going to interact with the kidney cells in exchange for the protons. Now it does that via the ion exchanger protein. Right? So there's a protein in your cell that acts like a tunnel and it exchanges sodium for protons. The proton then interacts with the bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's how, when I said, you remember the diagram with the blood vessels and whatever? Well, the acid combines with the bicarbonate to form the CO2. Yes, it makes an intermediate of carbon, or sorry, of carbonic acid, but it's so fast that you can just consider it making CO2, all right? So the net reaction would have to be bicarbonate plus acid gives you CO2. Now, if this needs to happen, it will most likely happen, meaning that CO2 is a nonpolar substance, right? So this is nonpolar, right? And it can actually go through the kidney cell and start a chain reaction again. So if it infiltrates the, the, the kidney cell, it could break up, it could disassociate into the acid and into the bicarbonate, okay? So that's the base. And again, you're gonna have this chain reaction of the acid exchanging itself for the sodium, combining with the bicarbonate to form CO2, the CO2 goes back into the kidney cell, and it starts a perpetual loop, okay? So that's kind of like the role for the kidney cell in the carbonic bicarbonate buffer system. Sometimes the CO2 is lost, right? So eventually you can't have an infinite amount of CO2, right? That's You, you can't have an infinite amount of anything that defies physics. Well, eventually you're gonna lose CO2. So CO2 gradually depletes, right? So you're gonna have to take another breath and start the chain reaction again. But the kidneys don't like it when the CO2 depletes. So whenever the CO2 is starting to lower and lower and lower itself, the kidneys start creating bicarbonate. And it does that to avoid kind of like stopping the reaction because you never want that reaction to stop, right? That would cause like an organ failure and you don't want that. Right, so you don't want a renal, fail, uh, renal failure in your system. That's really uh, lethal, okay? Sometimes the kidneys actually generate CO2 um, via me metabolic functions, okay? So you can consider like the kidney as an engine, I guess. So whenever you're running the, the processes, right? So whenever you're making a reaction, some of the reactions create CO2 as a product and you don't want an excess of CO2 in the kidneys, right? Because that's pretty bad. It's slightly acidic, but it can somehow make the environment basic. So what I'm trying to say is, whenever you're running reactions in the kidney, some of the reactions form CO2, and you have to eliminate the CO2 buildup in the kidneys. So how does that happen? Well, for starters, some of the hyd well, 
the carbon dioxide can break into the acid and into bicarbonate. So the acid is going to be eliminated via an acid pump, so a proton pump. Now whenever that happens, it comes out via the urine, okay, so um, leaves as urine. And that is why urine is slightly acidic, okay, because in an, in an effort to lower the amount of carbon dioxide within the kidney cell, it is excreting acid out of the urine. For the rest of the bicarbonate, it's going to react with the iron, with, sorry, with the ion exchanger protein, okay? So again, the ion exchanger protein is pretty important. In this case, we're not working with sodium, we're gonna be working with chlorine, okay? So the bicarbonate leaves the exchanger pro, uh, protein and chlorine comes in, right? So that's essentially it. So this leaves as urine and the bicarbonate leaves into the blood. Now the bicarbonate is gonna react with the acid to form carbon dioxide and water and leave as, uh, you know, ex exhalation. So this goes back into the blood plus H plus, you see? And that leaves as H2O plus CO2 and you're gonna exhale. So that's what happens when you have a buildup. So you're gonna have uh, built up carbon dioxide. You have to release it somehow, so it breaks into an acid and bicarbonate. The acid leaves through the urine, that's why urine is slightly acidic, and the bicarbonate leaves via the ion exchanger protein in exchange for chlorine. Now the bicarbonate is gonna react with um, an acid in the blood to create water and carbon dioxide, and then you're gonna exhale both the water and carbon dioxide as normal. So now we will be talking about medical conditions referring to the acidity in blood, why it's so important. So you can see from this chart that the sweet spot would have to be 7.4 for your pH in blood. But if you were to be seven or 7.6, you would be in a dangerous zone. Now, death should occur around 6.8 or below. It can also occur from 7.8 and up, okay? So that's when you die, it's pretty bad. Uh, so you're probably wondering what alkalosis is and what acidosis is. All right. So we'll, we'll talk about alkalosis first. Whenever people are having a panic attack or they're on drugs and they're hyperventilating, they can have alkalosis, all right? So it's not just drugs, by the way. It could be like a cerebral hemorrhage or just anxiety. So whenever that happens they're breathing in really quickly right so they're breathing in but then they breathe out like very little so they go right so they're breathing in too much and they're exhaling a little bit so the o2 is going to be increasing but the co2 is going to be decreasing they're not producing a lot of co2 when that happens the acid also decreases okay so eventually there's going to be more uh, bicarbonate more basic material in the blood and not enough acidic material protons in the blood okay so whenever that happens the H goes down goes down and again this is alkalosis alkalosis and uh, CO2 goes down Okay, so first it's going to be CO2 goes down and then the uh, acid is going to go down, okay? And the pH is going to go up because you're entering a basic environment. So to recap, you're intaking more air than uh, the CO2 that is being exhaled, okay? So there's more uh, O2 than CO2. Now whenever that happens, the acid goes down as well and therefore the pH goes all the way up. It could be lethal if left unattended. And also, since the hydrogen goes downwards, the bicarbonate goes upwards, and therefore the net reaction is gonna to go towards the left. So the equilibrium uh, goes towards left. Okay. 
So, I mean, whenever I'm thinking about Le Chatelier's principle, I like to think of an aquarium tank. So imagine an aquarium tank, okay, with a very, very small um, uh, partition, I guess, right? So here's our partition that we're going to have. Right, and there's gonna be a partition. Now this partition is not all the way closed. There's like a centimeter of uh, gap between the partition and the bottom of the tank, okay? Now we're gonna fill this up with some water, okay? So if I am creating more water over here, more water over here, well, some of that water is gonna go and escape to the bottom of the tank and fill up, okay? There you go. Now, if I'm producing, let's say, more CO2, so if I'm producing more CO2, I'm gonna produce more acid. So if I'm producing more CO2, right here, then the acid is gonna increase and shift towards the right. So that is kind of like the aquarium uh, method that I use. So to recap, because we are decreasing the CO2, we're gonna increase the HCO3. Because we're adding more water, to this part, the water is going to escape and go here towards the left. Hopefully, that's what um, kind of clarifies the Chatelier's principle. So, to combat alkalosis, it's pretty simple. Uh, you remember in the old movies where someone would win the lottery and they would like hyperventilate and pass out? Well, you would often see people give them like a brown paper bag and they would kind of breathe into it and breathe out. So, what they're doing is they're putting the uh, little bit of carbon dioxide into the bag and then they're immediately taking in that carbon dioxide back into their system okay so essentially they're breathing into an uh, carbon dioxide enriched environment okay so it's not necessarily a bad thing um, to kind of breathe into a carbon dioxide rich environment okay so like I said, if you want to uh, combat alkalosis, make sure that you breathe into a carbon dioxide rich environment. Now, another way that you can combat alkalosis is to uh, react with NH4Cl. So whenever you do an NH4Cl infusion, the NHCl or the NH4Cl is going to enter the body, okay? And it's going to break or it's going to disassociate into NH4 and Cl, right? Now this right here can be in equilibrium, so maybe one second it's NH4, the other second it's going to be NH3, okay? Well, NH3 is extremely, extremely volatile in the body, so it's going to immediately come out via the breath, okay? So it's gonna like shoot out from the breath, leaving only uh, some H and Cl. Now, remember what happens in HCl, how it can react with the kidneys when there's an excess of CO2, okay? So that's gonna help us, and it's, uh, it's gonna alleviate some of the alkalosis in the body. Uh, therefore, the acid and the chlorine are going to lower the pH, so you go from 7.6 back to 7.4, which is very helpful. So, in other words, you have two ways of uh, combating some alkalosis. You can either breathe into a paper bag or a carbon dioxide rich environment, or you can do an NH4CO infusion. Okay. Okay, so that was kind of like the physical um, way to get alkalosis, but we're then going to talk about having uh, alkalosis via metabolic, um, sorry, via like metabolism or metabolic processes. Yeah, metabolic, sorry. So yeah, you can get alkalosis from breathing irregularly, but at the same time, you could get alkalosis from you know uh, vomiting or taking diuretics. So diuretics are um, kind of like drugs that remove a lot of water from your body. So for instance, when you're watching bodybuilders present themselves on stage, some of them uh, take diuretics and they flush out so much liquid from their bodies that their muscles um, kind of like deflate a little bit and their skin clings to their muscles showing off the, uh, the cuts that they have, you know, the bicep or the quadriceps, and they become really veiny and vernascular. So they think it's really good, but they're actually increasing their chances of alkalosis. And believe me, 
some bodybuilders have died from taking diuretics. So please don't take diuretics, right? And um, don't excessively vomit either, because then you're going to be increasing your alkalosis. So uh, let's let's actually get into how that occurs. Metabolic alkalosis is when you increase the amount of bicarbonate in the system or you decrease the amount of acid in the system okay so when you decrease the amount of acid in the system there's so many bicarbonates around right so because there's thousands and thousands of millions of bicarbonates in the system there's going to be a chance where they start reacting directly with the hydrogens so roughly a rule of thumb is that for every hydrogen that you lose, so one H loss is gonna be equal to one HCO3 uh, gained, okay? Gained. Now, whenever people vomit excessively, they're actually shifting their potassium, okay? So the potassium is going to leave the cells Okay, now when potassium leaves the cells, that leaves a gap, an opening for something to come in. Well, what comes in? Hydrogen. Hydrogen leaves the reaction and goes into the cell. Okay, so it leaves the um, reaction and goes into the cell, and therefore it increases the bicarbonate or the alkalosis effect, right? So alkalosis is just really the uh, absence of protons. So uh, whenever people uh, struggle with bulimia, meaning they have a disorder where they vomit excessively because they don't have a healthy relationship with food, you often see them faint because they're so weak, because their, uh, their, their blood is too basic. So that's kind of like the effect of excessively vomiting, okay? So when you excessively vomit, you actually lose the potassium from your cells. They go into the system. And the hydrogen from the cells, or sorry, the hydrogen from the system goes into the cells and creates kind of like a, an excess environment of bicarbonate, which increases the um, pH of the blood, which makes it alkalosis. And if you keep doing this, eventually, you will die from alkalosis. Right? So again, how do we combat alkalosis? Again, we can breathe into a paper bag and actually you know, create more CO2 or bring in more CO2, which in turn brings in more acid. Or, or the kidneys can go into overdrive and try to remove the excess amount of bicarbonate in the system, okay? So your kidneys can actually help you out, or you can help your kidneys out by breathing into a paper bag. Okay, so now we will be talking about metabolic acidosis, okay? And that is when you produce uh, too much acid and it actually uh, decreases the pH in the system. So, you know, usually this happens when, you know, hold, hold on, when there's an excess of CO2, right, there's going to be an excess of acid. Because again, if we use the aquarium um, kind of like example, and here's our little aquarium, and there's a little partition, if I add more CO2, over here, so if I add CO2, a lot of it is gonna come back out to kind of become equal, and what's gonna be produced is protons or acid, okay? So what happens, or what, when does the metabolic acidosis occur? Okay, well, metabolic acidosis occurs when there's an uncontrollable diabetes in the person. So we can have uh, diabetes, in that case, that would be called uh, keto acidosis. Also, starvation diets. So, if you starve yourself, that's going to be another cause of acidosis. We also have some high protein, uh, high protein 
and low fat diets. Also the overproduction of ketone bodies. Okay, and that lowers the pH. Also, sometimes when you're exercising, there's like a sudden surge of lactic acid, and that can cause acidosis. So, uh, large amounts of lactic acid. Now, what happens if we have some respiratory acidosis? What does that mean? It means that sometimes the lung is obstructed or fails to release CO2. So because you can't release your CO2, you're going to have a buildup of it. And of course, using Le Chatelier's principle, if you have an increase of CO2, you're going to have an increase of acid. All right. So one of the main causes of acidosis would have to be hypo, hypo, not hyper. Hyper is when you're exhaling too much. Hypo is when you're inhaling too much, okay? So hypo ventilation. Ventilation. So an excess of CO2, okay? Acidosis is typically solved uh, normally. You know, change your diet, breathe normally, you know, fix the lung so that it functions normally. If you need to do something sudden, uh, you can infuse uh, bicarbonate. You can infuse bicarbonate right here. So if you increase that, this is going to decrease, okay? So you can actually infuse, infuse uh, HCO3 as a treatment. Okay, there you go. Now, let's actually talk about acidosis whenever it's, um, you know, consumed. In the U.S., a lot of people, for some reason, drink antifreeze. Now, why would anybody drink antifreeze? Well, people, well, not most people, but some people drink antifreeze because it tastes slightly sweet and it gives the same effect as being drunk. So it's cheaper. You can buy, like, a gallon of it for a, I don't even know how much it costs, and you can feel drunk. But whenever you drink it, it will metabolize into glycolic acid, okay? Now glycolic acid is a very weird acid. Let's see if I can uh, write it out. So we're gonna write it out right here. It's gonna be uh, H-O-C-H-2-C-O-O-H, if I remember correctly. And you know, the pH of that pH uh, excuse me, not pH, but the rather pKa is going to be about 3.83, okay? So it's very acidic. Well, the antifreeze is going to metabolize into glycolic acid and react with the system to produce a lot of acids, okay? So it's going to create acidosis and it could potentially kill you, right? So what happens if your friend or you somehow drink antifreeze, right? Well, I recommend that you go to the store and buy some alcohol, right? Some drinking alcohol. So, you know, get like a 60% solution of, uh, <laughs> of vodka or something and drink it. Just chug it. Um, so the reason why you want to do that is because ethanol has a greater affinity towards the, um, towards the glycolic acid. Okay, so ethanol, which is just um, some like, one of the simplest things, right? So uh, it's a... It's, uh, CH3, actually I don't like that. So it's going to be HC, and then combine that with some carbon right here. And of course the alcohol, right? So if you drink a lot of uh, ethanol after you drink antifreeze, you should be fine because the ethanol is going to react with the glycolic acid and kind of like nullify it. So it cancels out and you won't die from acidosis, okay? So if you know anybody that drinks antifreeze, make sure they drink alcohol.
Of course, I don't recommend drinking antifreeze in the first place. We will now talk about the hemoglobin uh, transport system, or buffering system in this case. So the hemoglobin So what does it do? You can consider hemoglobins to be tiny little shuttles or trains that transport things, okay? So the blood can supply kind of like oxygen from the lungs into the surrounding tissues. So it can ship or transport trans transport um, oxygen from lungs to surrounding tissues. So it could be like the kidneys or the um, liver or whatever, but it's going to transport oxygen into those tissues. And in, in a similar uh, thought, in a similar idea, it can actually transfer uh, carbon dioxide from the tissues into the lungs into uh, exhalation. CO2 from tissues to lungs for exhalation. For exhalation, okay? So it's kind of like a perpetual train ride. Things go in, they go to different areas of the body, and then they take in CO2 and they transport the CO2 back into the lungs, and the lungs exhale the CO2. So that is the uh, hemoglobin buffer system, okay? Okay, so only about 20% of the CO2, so 20% of CO2 binds, and we're gonna call the red blood cells RBC, okay? Binds with red blood cells to leave the lungs. via exhalation. Okay. Now 70%, 70% are going to diffuse, okay? 70% of CO2 is going to diffuse from the red blood cells into the environment, okay? And kind of like react with um with water, okay? To form bicarbonate. So 70% of CO2 from the red blood cells react with uh, water to make the what? To make bicarbonate, okay? Actually, it makes carbonic acid, which then goes into uh, bicarbonate. Let's just make that into uh, something shorthand. So let's just put HCO3 negative, okay? And about 10% of the CO2 is dissolved in the plasma, right? So 10% of CO2 dissolves in plasma. Okay, so 20% of the CO2 actually goes on the red blood cell train to leave via the ox uh, via the lungs by exhalation. 70%, so a vast majority of the carbon dioxide, will kind of leave the red blood cell mid-destination. Uh, so, you know, it just jumps out. It, like, cracks open a window and jumps out like a, a superhero or something. And it's going to react with the water in the environment to make carbonic acid. Afterwards, the carbonic acid is going to react even further to make bicarbonate. Now, about 10% of the um, carbon dioxide ultimately dissolves in the plasma, never to be seen again. Ooh. Uh, sometimes the hydrogen can actually hitch a ride on the red blood cells and go into the lungs. From then, the acid is going to react with the bicarbonate and form CO2, and the CO2 is going to um, disperse whenever you exhale, okay? 
sometimes the bar carbonate is going to react with the plasma and it's going to exchange itself for some chlorine, okay? So that's kind of like two uh, tidbits that you need to know, right? And, uh, yeah, that's about it for the hemoglobin buffer system. And if you didn't notice, hemoglobin is a good buffer for carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So now we will be talking about uh, phosphoric acid species. This is like two minutes tops, okay? Uh, you're dealing with H2PO4, H2PO4 and minus, and uh, HPO4 uh, two minus, okay? So essentially that is dihydrogen uh, phosphate and uh, monohydrogen phosphate, okay? So the pKa for this is about 7.2, okay? So it's very close to the blood. And it's often used in labs to simulate uh, cellular conditions. So if you want to kind of replicate what happens in the body, in the lab, you would have to use uh, phosphoric acid buffers because they're very, very close to how your uh, blood reacts to certain uh, compounds, okay? For buffers in the urine, the ability to actually remove a ton of hydrogen from the urine has to be with uh, buffers. So if you didn't have buffers, then you would have to dilute uh, your urine with like a thousand times more water than acids, okay? So the presence of buffers allows you to remove um, acids with a little bit of water. If you didn't have buffers, you would have to have a ton of water in your system to even remove a little bit of acid, okay? There are actually three uh, buffers for the urine. Uh, one you know very in depth is about the um, carbonic acid bicarbonate uh, buffer system. You also know about the phosphoric acid buffer system. Essentially H2PO4 negative and HPO4 2 minus, right? So this is a very weak acid. So we're going to call this a weak acid right here and this is going to be the conjugate base. This is uh, acquired via the urine, obviously, since it's a buffer in the urine. So in medical terms, it's called filtration, but you know, when I'm talking to you, it's urine, right? So that occurs in your urine, and it's a good buffer because they're very close to each other. Um, well, their pKa is very close to the blood, so it can buffer um, systems quite well. And finally, there's also the ammonia system. So here we go, we have the ammonia, ammonia buffer system. Okay, and now there's gonna be like a really, really complex word and I don't wanna confuse you, so I'm not gonna describe it, I'm just gonna say its name and like pass on, okay? And it is the tubular deamination of glucose. Excuse me, actually glutamine. I don't know why I was thinking about glucose. Glutamine, okay. And it's gonna generate NH3, okay. It makes NH3, transports it, back into the tube, where it buffers um, H, so it buffers that. And it does that by becoming what? So if you add NH3 with a proton, what do you get? You get NH3. 
four plus, okay? So it's gonna generate, so all you need to know is that there's a little, little tube, okay, somewhere, and that generates glutamine, okay? And that glutamine makes NH3. The NH3 goes back into the tube, and it's gonna react with the acid in the tube. Now, whenever you add the acid with NH3, you're gonna get what? Ammonium, okay? Ammonium. So that's how it buffers that uh, system. And of course, bicarbonate is going to react with sodium. And of course, the ammonium is going to be transported uh, to the urinary space. Okay. So hopefully this helps you out. And um, that's, that's all for physiological buffers. And I know it was a long video. It's even longer for me to um, talk and edit. Okay. So yeah, hopefully this helps you out. And um, I'm glad that you sp took time to spend your day with me. So I hope you have a great day. And remember that I love you. Thank you and take care.